Dr. Sinclair is the author of Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. This is the book that the Harvard Chan School Alumni Book Club is reading, and we're lucky to have, uh, have him here with us this morning. Uh, as you know, uh, you may know, Dr. Sinclair is a professor of genetics at uh, Harvard Medical School. He is co-director of the Paul F. Glenn Center for the Biology of Aging Research at the Medical School and conjoint professor at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Uh, Dr. Sinclair is best known for his work on genes and small molecules that de delay aging. He serves as co-editor, uh, co-chief editor of the scientific journal Aging and has received numerous honors, including being one of Australia's leading scientists under 45, the Australian Medical Research Medal, uh, the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, Time Magazine's list of 100 most influential people in the world, and the top 50 people in healthcare. Dr. Sinclair was also elected an officer of the Order of Australia in 2018. And thank you again for being here with us to talk about your book. Um, so Dr. Sinclair, so we take aging for granted. I mean, it's, aging is inevitable. We're all going to get old and we're all going to die. Um, of course, the hope is that we are relatively healthy during the last decade or two of our lives but you contend that some will be, uh, someday we'll be able to turn back the clock on aging, perhaps by 10 years. So is science going to come to the rescue? Uh, are we going to be able to live not just longer, but healthier lives? Uh, well, absolutely we are. Uh, we've, we now have a very good handle on what causes us to grow old, uh, what lifestyle factors influence that. We can now measure biological age very accurately with a a swab, a cheek swab or a blood test. Um, and we now, just in the last few years, uh, I believe have a very good handle on, on understanding how to reverse the age of the body, not just slow down aging, but truly reset the, the youthful information that I believe resides in every cell in the body. And uh, three years ago, we didn't know that existed. We thought that aging was a one-way street and the best you could do was to slow it down. Uh, but as I'll tell you today, um, there's something brand new, you know, similar to, I would, I would liken it to uh, people who are trying to fly around the world in hot air balloons, thinking that was the best they could ever do. Um, and three years ago, the, we had the equivalent of the first powered flight uh, by the Wright brothers. And when that happens, then you really have to start changing your views of what's possible. So you talk about eating less in your book. That is like you, you say, to be hungry more often. Why is that? Yeah, so what's interesting about the science of aging is that people over the centuries, or arguably the millennia, have figured out why certain populations and individuals live longer than others. And, and it's just observation, right? It's, it's obvious that if you eat Mediterranean-like diets and you don't eat overeat, uh, carbohydrates in particular, but be, be, if you become obese, if you don't move, these lead to poor health outcomes and shorter lifespans. And we can do this to animals in the lab. It's pretty easy. You can shorten their lifespan by about 40%. And the opposite is true as well. If you take animals, and I include dogs and rats, um, mice, of course, in my lab, if you restrict how much they eat, uh, roughly 20, 30%. I mean, it doesn't matter how you do it, as long as you do it, you can skip a meal a day or you can just give them a little bit each meal. That has remarkable longevity and health benefits so that they're not just living longer, actually at the same age, uh, they are remarkably healthier compared to the mice that ate whatever they wanted to called ad libitum. So this is not new and it's not even rocket science. Um, even exercise, we know that 10 minutes of losing your breath every day has health benefits, but nobody's really come up with a good explanation as to why that happens. It's so obvious we take it for granted, but why does eating, eating less make you healthier? And that's where these breakthroughs have come in. Uh, my field over the last 20 years have discovered uh, three key areas in the cell, three key genetic pathways that respond to diet and exercise and hunger uh, and turn on the body's natural defenses against the deterioration process we call aging. Um, and then we've taken that just recently much further and 
achieved what exercise and a good healthy diet could could never alone do and that is reset the age of the body well, you talk keeping with the line of diets. You talk about longevity diets. So, what would be what's, a, what's an example of the best a best diet? All right. So, we don't know the best diet partly because um, everybody's different um, and everybody has different uh, uh, you know levels of willpower. The one that that I do uh, is called the sixteen eight. I try to skip breakfast. I have a little bit of breakfast. Um, I'll show you. So this is a typical breakfast for me. It's a couple of spoonfuls of, of low fat yogurt, uh, plain yogurt with some resveratrol and some NMN thrown in. The, I can tell you later what they do, but these are molecules we've discovered in my lab uh, to um, activate defenses in the body that we call the sirtuins. Um, do I know that this is going to make me live longer? No. Um, but do I know that they're very, very safe and very cheap? Yeah, so that's the risk I'm taking. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to live forever. Uh, any of you who've seen what car of, kind of car I drive, I drive a Tesla, you know, you can tell that I'm not trying to live forever, but I am trying to learn things uh, within the short time that I have on this planet. There's not much time left, I'm, I'm now 51. Um, my father has a very similar diet um, eating these molecules, very small breakfast, try to skip lunch or have just a tiny um, lunch, maybe a salad. Uh, and then, then dinner is, is, is normal. You know, some alcohol, I even eat meat if I've been working out. So it's, I put all my enjoyment towards the end of the day. But if you don't like dinner, you can have a big breakfast. But as long as one of the meals in your, your day has been skipped, that's a very good start. But some people are better than me. Some people can skip meals entirely for two or three days. Uh, even some people go for a week, which I suppose may be better than what I do. I, I just cannot do it. Uh, I cannot function. I, I tend to get too hungry. Um, but the way I do it uh, with a bit of yogurt in the morning with my pill, uh, I don't get, don't get hungry at all. In fact, I feel a lot better not being bloated. So this question came up in the book club discussion. Uh, it's about the ethical implications of people living and working longer. So uh, what are the toll on the environment or uh, unemployment if older people aren't retiring or on healthcare, on the healthcare industry? I think you might actually touch on this at the end of the book. So some of our readers may not be there yet, uh, but what are your thoughts on these questions and what do we need to do to prepare for li everyone living longer? Yeah, it's, it's so counterintuitive. And that's why one of the reasons I wrote the book is that when you really do look into the numbers, we cannot use the 20th century as our guide. 20th century was a period of a lot of population growth, um, periods of unemployment, and a huge ride, rise in healthcare. It, it turns out, if, if you model it, and I have with some very good economists, um, in terms of population, we desperately have to do something about our population, and it's declining. Uh, except for Africa, the world's population is is falling precipitously um, and COVID-19 is not helping. It's estimated that a country like Japan will have about half the population by the end of this century and Italy about the same. Uh, the US population is already on the decline finally. Now you might say, well, that's good. We don't want as many people. They're just annoying. They just create pollution. But for an economy to thrive and to be able to pay for healthcare, uh, you just cannot dramatically lose the younger population. You know, we can see what's happening to the Japanese population and their economy there. They've been struggling. So what this offers is a chance for uh, the elderly to be less of a burden, the older people to be less a burden on their children and their grandchildren. Uh, if you take my father, for example, he's 81. He started a new career in his late 70s. He's as fit as I am. He's stronger than I am in the gym. Um, and he's a real productive member of society, as opposed to the average 81-year-old who is, uh, many of them who have, who've died already, uh, and the others are uh, heading into the nursing home where they are very expensive to look after by the family and the government. Um, so yeah, ec economically, this is the best way to save the world. Um, we already spend 17% of our GDP in the US on mostly treating the elderly. 
if we can keep people healthy and alive for another five, 10 years and then have them die relatively quickly, which is what tends to happen if you are healthy, uh, GDP would, would go up. We've calculated uh, at least 4% uh, over the first five years and with over a trillion dollars savings. And that trillions of dollars, those trillions of dollars can be put back into things like addressing climate change and improving education. So it's, it's actually the opposite of what you might think would happen if we do this. Interesting. Okay. So uh, you talk about how we are great survivors. Uh, our genes are born of great survivors and that a little bit of stress that occurs when our genes are activated helps us live longer. Uh, for example, you talk about exposure to cold and hot temperatures as a way to act for our bodies to activate all the right stuff, very technical term, all the right stuff. Um, what if you don't have access to these, these opportunities, if you perhaps live in Arizona or you don't ever see snow or you don't have access to a sauna, um, what are some ways for all of us that we can activate that stress? Yeah, well, really anything that makes your body worry about the future. Um, besides chronic mental stress, that's not good for you, but biological stress, making your muscles a little bit concerned or your brain. This is called hormesis. Uh, think of hormesis as what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And we have these defenses. The genes that we work on are called sirtuins. There are seven of those genes in our body. They're found in all life forms, even plants. And there are other longevity genes. There's one called mTOR, which senses amino acids and protein. And then there's a third main pathway called AMPK, which the drug metformin, a diabetes drug, works on. And together, those three pathways will sense whether you're in trouble. So how do you fool your body into thinking times are not easy, times could be tough? Well, one is we talk about eating less. Eating less tells your body, wow, we might be running out of food. That's pretty easy. Turns on defenses. Uh, running mimics getting chased by another tribe or a saber-toothed tiger. Uh, that's pretty good. Um, lifting weights is another way. I, I do mostly that. I go to the gym a few times a week uh, and work out and stretch and just make sure that my, my muscles don't atrophy. That's essential for mobility and safety in older age. Um, other things you can do is that the type of food you eat is important. Uh, for instance, olive oil. So olive oil, you know, you can roll your eyes. Yeah, it's in, it's in the Mediterranean diet. It's in, uh, it's in um, salad dressings. But what has been found molecularly is that it activates a particular defensive enzyme that we work on called SIRT1, one of these sirtuins. The same way that the red wine molecule, resveratrol, works. You know, so I've just eaten some resveratrol powder. Uh, I could have very well eaten a spoonful of olive oil and probably had a similar effect. So those kinds of things in your Mediterranean diet, those plant-based molecules are also telling your body times might be tough. Now you might, might ask, why would olive oil tell your body that times could be tough? Um, well, it turns out that oleic acid, which is in olive oil, is also generated by our own bodies when we're hungry. When our fat breaks down, we make olive oil, oleic acid, and that's the signal for our bodies to fight disease. And we're just lucky that it's also found in foods that we like. Resveratrol is the same thing. Resveratrol um, works the same way. It turns on the enzyme, makes it more active. Um, and it just happens to be concentrated in red wine. Um, and we, it's no coincidence when you want a lot of resveratrol and flavor in a, in a red wine, you stress the plants before you harvest them. You give them hormesis, you give them less water, pick them when they're dry or infected with a fungus. And that's why they'll have those molecules. We actually get, gave a name to those kind of molecules. They're called xenohormetic molecules, like foreign hormesis. Um, and so that's another way uh, in diet. Um, cold and hot, it's not totally proven that they work. Um, if anything, they certainly make you more, more vigorous. Um, it's, there's a fair amount of data on saunas from Nordic countries. Uh, particularly businessmen have been studied for whatever reason, and uh, these men who regularly sauna bathe at home a few times a week have significantly less, I think it's about 30% fewer heart attacks. So there's some science behind it, but it's hard to know exactly how those are working. Well, I'm glad you mentioned uh, metformin and 
Zerner Hall. Um, in the book, you also mentioned uh, rapamycin, and and forgive me if I'm combining everything, but NAD plus, um, and you mentioned your father and the NMN. So it sounds like I mean, when I looked, it looks like N NMN is what you can actually buy on at the stores. So should people be buying NMN? Uh, well, I, I stay clear of the supplement world. Um, I, I have to because I, I'm a serious scientist. I'm not promoting products. Um, but other people have taken my research and made products, which I cannot vouch for because I don't test them. Um, but in, in general, supplements should be GMP, uh, good, good manufacturing practices or procedures, um, and look for uh, the purest you can find from a reputable company. Uh, that's what I, I do. But uh, yeah, I, I take NMN that we test um, rigorously, uh, but I, I don't make, make anything uh, available publicly. I just, I just cannot for legal and um, reputational reasons. Um, you know, but that said, you, you can get it. You can get NMN from reputable suppliers. I, I take a gram of NMN every morning, um, which is a precursor to NAD. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about NAD. So I've talked about these sirtuin enzymes. Think of them as, uh, I think you all would know what a Pac-Man is or a traffic cop. Um, as you get older, you have less NAD so that they're, they're going slowly. Sirtuins don't work without NAD. And uh, NAD precursors will raise the levels of NAD so that the sirtuins can work more accurately and more efficiently and, uh, and carry out the repair systems in the cell. And they do many different things. They boost energy. They promote cell survival. They boost blood flow, we've shown. You can have mice, old mice that are in, have great endurance. Um, and others have shown protection of organs from a variety of things, uh, even cancer. Um, we're doing human clinical trials with um, a molecule related to NMN. Uh, we've been doing them for two years now. And so I'm hopeful in, in the next year or two, I'll be able to report back if any of those wonderful effects in mice are seen in elderly people as well. And we, we also have a COVID-19 study that's just begun because there's some evidence that the virus is, is actually depleting the NAD molecule in its uh, part of its attack of human cells. So I have a poll for people to uh, answer. I'm gonna launch that poll. And hopefully people can see that. And does everyone see that poll? Good. Give it a couple more seconds. Okay, we'll start the poll. I take antioxidants or vitamin supplements. Um, do people see the results? There you go. Uh, about half take them daily. Uh, just a little bit um, less than that, uh, never. And then 13% uh, uh, a few times a week. So um, the reason why I asked that question is I want to share my screen. You say antioxidants don't work. Why? Uh, well, I, I don't say antioxidants don't work. Uh, <laughs> they, they, do, they do mop up free radicals. Uh, but in the history of longevity research, uh, they've been disappointing. Uh, very few accounts of them extending the lifespan of any animals. Um, and when they do, the question is, are they really working by mopping up free radicals or are they working by some hormesis effect? So resveratrol, for example, used to be thought of as an antioxidant. Um, but we, in my lab, we've clearly shown that it's not the antioxidant properties that make it effective. It's because it's actually a signaling molecule that turns on our natural defenses against antioxidants. So it, it can fool you. And one of the first tests we did was we took away the antioxidant activity of resveratrol by chemically changing it, and it still worked. So that's pretty good evidence. Um, I, I'm not the only one who says this, by the way. Most people in the field have gone away from antioxidants. Um, 
not just because empirically they don't don't extend lifespan in very often, but but also because there's a lot of other things that the cell needs to address. Um, antioxidants came out of the 1950s. Uh, Denham Harmon did some very good work, and their theory was that causing mutations uh, a, a mutations are causing aging. And while that's a part of aging, it's not the main part. Um, and so that explains why you need to do a lot more than just take antioxidants. And then the final thought is that it's been shown that in animals at least, that uh, and in humans, that antioxidants can blunt the benefits of exercise. And so we need antioxidant, uh, we need oxidants, we need free radicals to actually benefit from these uh, lifestyle changes. And uh, if you take a worm, nematode worm, and give it antioxidants, uh, will, it will actually live shorter in the context of longevity genes. And uh, Michael Ristow, R-I-S-T-O-W, has done a lot of work where he, he is an advocate of mitochondrial hormesis or mitohormesis, where uh, if you suppress free radicals, you're not going to get the full benefit of the longevity genes or the, the lifestyle changes. There's a question. I'll read that. Uh, you have suggested that our survival depends on consuming less, uh, innovating more and bringing balance to our relationship with the natural world, as well as the need to be more empathetic and just. But what if that is um, not the sentiment of the majority and so it does not, doesn't happen that way? What if the more affluent people are able to take up your research and extend their lives and the less affluent are not able to? And we end up in the dystopias of so many sci-fi movies. What can prevent that from happening? Uh, well, the FDA will make sure that it's uh, equitable. Now, it's going to, some of the drugs may end up being expensive at first, uh, especially the gene therapies. But others, which are just small molecules like NMN, are, are cheap. And so they should be affordable by everybody on the planet once, once it's widely distributed and you know, all patents expire eventually. So it's similar to all new technologies. If you're the first, first person to buy a giant screen flat TV, yeah, it's going to be you know, 10 times more than other people will pay, but within a, a few years, it'll come down in price. It, it's not as though we can develop a medicine that will make people live 10 years and keep that a secret. Uh, that, that's not going to happen. Uh, it is going to be available to the entire world. Um, and my research is mostly aimed at trying to make it um, available to everybody. Uh, someone writes, my maternal grandmother died at 104. Her 100, 100 birthday was amazing. She was happy and lucid. But by 103, my guess is she would have loved to skip that last birthday. Extending life is one thing. Having quality is another. What are the most important aspects of your research that, would, that we should pay attention to that increase quality of life outside known things like exercise, good diet, and improved sleep? Uh, yeah, well, so this is this is a typical case that the older you live, the faster you die, which is a good thing, right? I think we all know somebody who's become sick at 50, and it can be a very drawn-out, uh, painful and expensive process, whereas here, people who live over 100 tend to cost only a third of the medical costs of uh, the rest of us. So that's something, this is a very positive story. Um, so the other question at the bottom is, what should we do to increase quality of life besides exercise, good diet, and improved sleep? Well, if you do those things and you don't smoke and uh, you maintain flexibility and a social network, uh, you're already estimated to get another 15 years of life beyond those who don't. So it's pretty easy to, to get another decade and a half. Going beyond that, getting to 100, that's, that's more challenging because, uh, as I'll explain, our bodies are losing information all the time and trying to preserve that information is, is tough. Uh, but what else could we do? You know, the, the supplements that I'm taking, I'm hoping will enhance the benefits of the exercise and the good diet. Uh, the sleep is definitely important. We know that the genes that control sleep are intimately related to the genes that control lifespan. So that's, that's not a coincidence. Um, I think keeping the brain active is very, very important. Um, so continuing to work or continuing to do stimulating activities um, is key as well. Um, yeah, avoiding things that will slow down your blood flow. 
you know, vascular dementia is a, is a major problem in society and we need to keep that blood flowing. So exercise will do that. Um, but what will also happen uh, is if you uh, just go walking and get your, uh, your body moving, that will also um, do wonders actually. Another thing you can do is to get, or to stay with your partner, uh, stay with your social group, uh, and even get a pet. Pets do uh, correlate with longer lifespan. Okay. Trying to get to the next one. Yeah, of, often people who live over 100 also, uh, two things they say, they say they drink red wine, they have olive oil, and they have a good sense of humor, and they never get totally stressed out about life which uh, it does make sense. Constant cortisol levels cannot be good for you. We've seen what happens to presidents during their term. Right, their exactly. Term, inner spiritual healing affect our aging process. You know, I haven't studied that. What I would say is, is what I was just saying, that if you are calm um, and you don't get stressed, especially during a time like now where there is a lot of worry, then I, I'm certain that uh, you will age slower. Um, these stress hormones that circulate through your body, the ones that make you jump at the first thing that, you know, a loud noise, uh, you got to avoid those because uh, we know in animals and people, they will, in the long term, um, accelerate your aging clock. It seems to me that everything is defined by its opposite. If we eliminate disease, can we still enjoy health? If we eliminate death, can we still enjoy life? Uh, well, first of all, I don't think we can eliminate death. It's, you know, it's like saying, can we eliminate cancer? Probably not. We're always going to live with it. But we will get better at treating it. Um, and it won't be you know, a death sentence the moment you are diagnosed with it. Um, I can tell you personally, uh, having watched my, my mother die in front of me um, and then my father thrive at the same age, um, I, would, I, would, uh, I would not wish what happened to my mother on anybody. Uh, and then my father is leading a very productive, healthy and um, satisfying life, helping raise the grandkids. Um, so I'm all in favor of keeping people healthier for longer. And if you ask my father, is he happier in his situation uh, he would say 100% that the ability for him to still be in perfect health at 81, traveling the world, mentally perfect, enjoying life. I mean, that, that's what we're striving for. We're not striving for immortality. Um, we're striving for an extra 10 years, 15 years of good health. Um, and that, to me, says, of course, we're going to still enjoy life. In fact, we're going to enjoy life far more than we ever did because we can have all that wisdom and knowledge uh, and share that with society and our, our descendants. I read in the book about laboratory studies on aging and about insect or animal research on aging. Have there been or are there ongoing clinical trials in humans to see if preventive dietary supplements or medications such as uh, metformin are effective in slowing the aging process in humans? Yes, there have been many. Uh, metformin has been studied in tens of thousands of people. And these are called uh, retrospective studies because the original studies were not designed to test lifespan. Uh, but nevertheless, there's, because there's so many people involved in these studies, uh, they are quite powerful. And there are a couple of studies that people point to that show that if you go on metformin, which is typically the first thing you do when you have high blood sugar, um, age-associated diabetes, uh, when you monitor those people for overall health, uh, it's very striking. The, the curves on the paper, the people that don't take metformin, the chance of getting cancer, heart disease, frailty um, go up, and those on metformin actually go down in the high-risk groups. Now, we don't know if they're going to live longer, but it's as close as evidence that that's actually slowing down aging. And of course, aging is the major contributor to these, these diseases. They don't just pop out of nowhere. 10-year-olds don't get Alzheimer's and heart disease. There's a reason for that. Their bodies can fight it. As we get older, we, we're, we're less able to. 
Um, so yes, metformin, a lot of good data. We need to raise money. Um, Neil Barzilai uh, is a good friend of mine at Albert Einstein. He's leading the charge to raise uh, up to $50 million to do a rigorous study of metformin. Uh, NMN is and a molecule like NMN is in clinical trials for longevity. We're seeing promising results in mice for longevity. I haven't published that yet. Um, there are drugs called senolytics, which destroy senescent cells that build up in the body uh, and seem to accelerate our aging. There are a number of clinical trials ongoing, uh, at least three of those. And uh, there's just a lot of others. There's ones that attack misfolded proteins. There are stem cell therapies. Um, there are drugs in development to mimic caloric restriction and burn fat by uh, disrupting mitochondria and poking holes in them like a, a hole in a, a hydroelectric dam. So there's a, really a lot going on beyond the, the mouse studies and worm studies that we scientists talk about. Um, and somebody's going to break, break through and prove that this is possible. And ultimately, my goal, my hope at least, is that the World Health Organization, which recently declared aging a medical condition, will also, that term will be adopted by a country, whether it's Israel or the UAE or Australia or UK, maybe the US. It doesn't matter. The first country to declare aging a treatable condition will get the attention of the world and I think get a lot of funding and research. And I expect from there it'll spread so that your average doctor who sees that you're starting to go down the path of decline, getting a little bit more frail, more susceptible to cancer and heart disease, uh, will feel ethically able to prescribe you a metformin pill or something else. Um, that's the future, uh, but we need to also change regulation, not just uh, get these medicines on the market. I'm gonna stop this and we're gonna go to our chat box. Um, so we have a couple of questions, uh, a few questions here. So, uh, one person says, how do you prefer to measure biological aging? Is it just telomere length or something else? Yeah, telomere length uh, can still be measured, but it's not very accurate because telomeres, telomeres surprisingly vary in their length. And so the, the gold standard now is what's called the Horvath clock, named after uh, my good friend, Stephen Horvath at UCLA. And what he discovered about 13 years ago is that there are chemicals called methyls that accumulate on DNA, similar to plaque that accumulates on your DNA, on your teeth. And uh, you can measure that. We use a simple DNA sequencer, costs a couple of hundred bucks. And then he or I could tell you very accurately within 5% error, how old you are biologically, not, not chronologically. And even estimate if you don't change your life, when you're gonna die with some accuracy. And uh, a lot of people are scared to do that. Uh, in fact, I haven't even done it yet. Um, I keep saying I will. Uh, but the point being is that we have an accurate clock that tells us how old we are and how old our various organs are. And uh, there's some new studies that show that you can reverse the age of that clock. And when you do that, you get improved health. One study uh, was by Stephen Horvath and, and some collaborators just a few months ago. They gave young, blood from rats, a cocktail, uh, and they gave it to old rats and measured the age of the organs in the animal. And some of the organs, I forget which one, I think it might've been the heart, went back 74% in its age. Overall, if you average the organs, it was about half the age of, um, of the original animal. So what that says is that there are factors that could be given as medicines to really turn back the age of the body. Now, my research has been focused on using three genes that are embryonic, that are switched off as we get adults. And by turning those three embryonic genes on in an adult, we also can reprogram the cell to be young again. And we actually can take a mouse that has lost its eyesight because it's old, and we give a gene therapy with three different genes in the retina, turn on those genes just for three weeks, and those mice can see perfectly just like they were young again. Um, and that's true for mouse models of glaucoma and even pinched optic nerves. We can regrow the optic nerves. So we're pushing forward um, in a company to within two years test if it's possible to reverse vision loss in patients that have lost vision from glaucoma. 
Um, so the summary is that we can measure age and we can also now reverse it with a couple of new technologies. Uh, here's another question. Because religion exists when man realizes his mortality, is this process of prolonging life one that may lead to the death of modern religion? Uh, I, I doubt it. Um, we're living a lot longer than we used to, and uh, there's still religion. So I, I think religion serves more of a purpose than just worrying about when you're going to get sick in life. Um, I mean, it might be different if we all become immortal, but I don't know of any technology yet that could do that. Um, maybe a super reprogramming system. Um, but yeah, I find it hard to put my mind in, into uh, that because I'm, I'm not a super religious person myself. You know, science has become my religion, trying to find out answers through the scientific method. Uh, but just if you look at history, our ability to treat cancer and heart disease, um, I don't think has changed our, our religiosity uh, directly. If there's a change in how much religion there is, I think it's due to other changes in society uh, rather than lifespan extension. Okay. There's also a question here uh, about uh, PTSD. Um, and uh, the person says, I assume that there's, you know, that these are not the good types of stress to make us healthy. Have you had a chance to study this in, in particular? Do you, do you have any thoughts or tips on how to help those suffering from those particular disorders to be healthier? Oh gosh, yeah, I, I want to study it because um, so many of us are experiencing it. Um, no, I, I don't. We've, we've tried to do a little bit of work on PTSD, um, nothing to, to publish. Um, it, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a key question. Can we use these same defense modalities, sirtuins, AMPK, mTOR, to improve the resilience of the mind? Uh, we, we literally don't know that. One experiment that we're doing, though, is, as I mentioned, we can reprogram the eye. We're now going to reprogram the entire brain and make it young again. And that could be an, a therapy for PTSD. Um, you know, maybe you can go back to a state before you had the incidents. Uh, and then, uh, you know, have a young brain again, but not lose the memories. So we're, we're going to try that. Okay. Uh, back to antioxidants. Uh, uh, maybe not beneficial for longevity, but what about the benefits for preventing or fighting cancer or reducing health impacts of exposure to environmental toxins? Um, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not against antioxidants. I'm, my stance on it is that the science says that they're they're not going to extend your lifespan. But yeah, a, a vitamin pill with some antioxidants, I don't see any harm um, for those reasons for for trying to slow down the rates of cancer. Um, I just think that there are better ways to do it by turning on these natural defenses that we all have uh, in ways that I've discussed today, or or just flick to page three hundred and four of my book. It's all written down there. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm not, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying stop taking antioxidants. I'm just saying they're not the, the cure-all that we thought they were in the 1970s. Uh, have there been any studies on metformin in women with no, uh, normal ovarian function and healthy glucose metabolism? Uh, if not, would it be safe for healthy women to take metformin? Well, I'm not an MD or an endocrinologist. My reading of the literature, which would need to be checked, is that metformin is given to women who have certain infertility problems, and it seems to help. Um, and same with NMN, if we give NMN to um, mice, old mice or old horses, we get improved fertility. Uh, so yeah, I think, you know, check the literature, check with doctors, but I, I, I do believe that the molecules we're talking about today, such as metformin and NMN, uh, could be beneficial for women who have low fertility, um, depending on the reason of it for their fertility, of course. Okay. Uh, can you talk about the difference between uh, mTOR and sirtuins? Yeah, right. Um, so mTOR is a, a complex of proteins that senses certain amino acids. So if you eat a big steak, mTOR will be activated and it will turn on 
your body's ability to make protein, right? That's what you need. You eat, you eat a steak, you, you make it into amino acids, then you make your own protein. Uh, the problem, if you're always eating meat, is that your mTOR is always on. And if, you're, if you don't have low levels of mTOR sometimes, then mTOR won't start to clean out your cells. So mTOR is very important for what's called autophagy or autophagy, which is the chewing up of old proteins that accumulate. The best example of a disease that is caused by accumulated crystallized proteins is Alzheimer's disease. But all cells accumulate these old proteins. And uh, so mTOR is very good at, at turning on these deep cleanse, deep cleansing processes. Um, but if you're eating meat every meal, you're not going to turn that on. Uh, and so that's, that's the main thing about mTOR. There's a drug called rapamycin, which is used for transplant rejection. Um, it's got some side effects, so it's not something you'd want to take lightly, um, and certainly not without doctor's supervision. Um, low doses seem to be taken by some people in the hope that that will clean out cells and give some health and longevity. Um, it looks promising. Uh, rap logs, as they're called, molecules like rapamycin, and rapamycin itself have greatly extended the lifespan of mice uh, and worms and yeast. So it's arguably the most potent drug that we have against aging right now. Um, you know, the caveat being it's not perfectly safe. Uh, but that's how, that's how mTOR works. Um, did you want me to talk about sirtuins in comparison? Yes, sure. So mTOR and sirtuins and AMPK, they all talk to each other. Uh, we used to fight in the field about whose pathway was more important than the others, and the mTOR group was against the sirtuins. But the reality is that if you tweak this, the mTOR pathway, the sirtuins will change and vice versa. Um, so the sirtuins, there's seven of them. They're found in a variety of places in the cell. There's three in the nucleus. There's three in mitochondria, and there's one floating around in between. And they take care of telomeres. They take care of cell survival, um, repair DNA damage. The list goes on. They even control how, how much um, fat we put on. So they are essential. If you have mice that have more sirtuins, they, they tend to live longer. Um, number six, sirtuin six seems seem to be very effective. But the problem for the sirtuins is that they need this molecule called NAD to work. And as we get older, we have less and less NAD. And uh, if you look at skin of a 50 year old, like, like me, the levels of NAD are now half of what they were when I was 20, uh, assuming I'm an average human being. And uh, so that's scary. That means the sirtuin defenses against diseases and decay are only probably half as active as they used to be. So that's why I take NMN, which has been shown in humans to raise the NAD levels back up to youthful levels. And the hope is that people who do that, uh, myself included, will have the, the defenses that, and the rigor um, of a much younger person. Uh, and we'll see, you know, proof's in the pudding, right? It's a long-term experiment. Um, I've still got hair, I don't have much gray. I can see perfectly and my mind is intact. But, uh, you know, if, if I come back in 30 years, you know, and I haven't changed, then something, something good's going on. But it's a long, long experiment. And an N of one, as we call it, is not a clinical trial. So that's why, in parallel, I'm doing these very rigorous clinical trials at Harvard University. So the book talks about reducing healthcare costs because people are more healthy throughout their life. Um, how many new, but many th new therapies, such as gene therapies, are incredibly expensive. How will the therapies not be more expensive for our health system? Uh, well, small molecules, so little chemicals, can be a few cents a day, like metformin. Um, I mean, eventually they come down in price, the, the patents run out, and they become generic. And if they're safe enough, they're even over the counter. So I could imagine a day when you could have a pill or a cocktail of pills uh, at your local pharmacy that you could just go get at age 50. Um, and the technology will just continue to get better. Metformin, for example, if you can convince your doctor that it's going to be helpful for you, even if you don't have diabetes. Uh, and there, there are some doctors that are open to this possibility. 
Uh, that drug, I think, costs me less than a dollar a day. It's one of the cheapest drugs on the planet. Um, World Health Organization says it's an essential medicine for humanity. Uh, you can even buy it over the counter uh, in most developing countries. You know, when, when I go to Thailand, I'm amazed. I can buy boxes of it for 20 bucks. So that, you know, we're, we're already there almost. And that those drugs are a role model for the way this will go. Now, there's no denying that gene therapy to restore vision is going to be expensive. It might be half a million bucks per treatment. Um, but again, we're, we're, we have to start somewhere. And once we learn how to do the gene therapy, then we could replace that with a very simple therapy, hopefully with a pill or uh, an injection of some liquid into the eye. Um, but all technologies go that way. It's not just pharmaceutical companies. You know, the first people who flew on airplanes uh, didn't get cheap tickets either. But uh, as soon as entrepreneurs took over it uh, and it expanded into big industries, then the price always comes down. So your book proposes that we could live an extra 25 or 50 years. Um, but why are you only saying 10 years as of today? Um, well, there's so many variables and, you know, one variable is, uh, luck. One variable is in a number in the number of dollars invested and, uh, regulatory variables, social variables. Um, uh, and even, um, the, the willingness of society to embrace this can change it. So what, you know, I've, I was once quoted saying the first person to make it to 150 has already been born and the Australian prime minister picked it up and it went around the world. And I had a colleague call me up and say, uh, essentially, can you just keep your mouth shut? Um, and that, that stung, you know, you always want respect from your peers. And I, I don't say that anymore. Um, not, not because I don't believe it, but there's really no point to me making those uh, guesses. I'd rather focus on the short term, which I, I do have a better vision into. And I don't see why the, the technologies that I've talked about today couldn't extend lifespan by 10 years. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that just doing five of the right things that doctors tell us already gives us 15 years advantage, right? That's not even difficult. Um, and so it should very much be possible to go another 10 years of healthy life if we are able to embrace these new technologies. Now, can we go beyond that? Absolutely. Why would technology stop at 10 years? It'll just keep going. But it is fair to say that the longer we live, the harder it is to extend lifespan because we're coming up against these natural barriers. Uh, but I'm much more optimistic now than I was two years ago, now that I know that it's possible to reset the age of cells uh, safely. Safely, we, we don't cause cancer, we don't see any issues. Um, until then, all we were doing was slowing down aging. Now I think it's possible to totally reset the age of the body. Uh, and if we can do that, then, you know, if you dream a little, you could imagine having a three week treatment of a gene therapy um, and your body literally goes back a couple of decades. Uh, and then you just come back in 20 years for another treatment. That isn't outside the realm of, of biology or physics because we're already doing that on a small scale in animals. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the linkage between brain and external computers uh, extending life? Uh, you mean uh, the, the work that Elon Musk and others are working on? <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. I mean, that's what their question yeah. is. Well, you know, I'm, I think it's arrogant to think that we are anywhere near having technology to mimic the human brain. The human brain is the most complicated structure in the universe. And it's, it's a little bit like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle where if you look at something, you've already changed it. Um, same with the brain. You go in, you, you, you look at it, and it's going to change by the time you've looked at it. So I'm... I'm skeptical that within our lifetimes, we'll be able to download more than a few thoughts. We, I don't think we'll ever have a brain, virtual brain in a bottle uh, anytime that we're alive, unfortunately. 
I mean, that would be a nice way to get out of it, this problem. So instead, my goal is to keep our existing brains healthy. Um, and uh, that seemed to be very doable. Okay. Uh, for the last question, um, uh, one question first asks about what your doctor said when you, when they, maybe he or she learned you were taking metformin, but the, I'm going to expand upon that and say that if, uh, if people went up to their physician uh, and said, I am going to do all these things, I'm going to take NMN and, and I'm going to drink a glass of wine and I'm going to do, I read David Sinclair's book and I'm going to live another 15 years. Do you, ha, what would be the response from the medical community? Have they caught up to uh, sort of the science behind uh, treating aging as a condition or is it like, would they pat them on their soul shoulder and say, well, that's good. At least you'll, you'll, you'll feel good. You'll be healthy, but you know, you're not going to live forever. Yeah. The medical profession has a ways to catch up. Um, they have to overturn the philosophy that they were trained in, which is aging is natural. And then we treat the consequences. Um, my view is that, uh, it's okay to try and prevent people falling off the cliff, but we also figure out why people get to the cliff in the first place. And that, that journey to the cliff seems to be ignored by the medical profession right now, even to the point of scoffing at anybody who talks otherwise. You know, you typically don't get treated for a disease that you haven't got yet, even though you know it's coming. The statins are one exception in high blood pressure. Um, but yeah, I hope that these pills will be used like statins where you have a biological age test and you come up at age 55 in that test. And then insurance companies after that age will reimburse you for treatments to slow down or reverse your biological age. But we're not there yet. Um, my doctor is pretty conservative. Uh, he doesn't let me, uh, he doesn't prescribe metformin for me. Um, I have other colleagues that, that, are, that know the literature and, and do that for me, but it's tough. It is really tough. If you, I think if you go into your, your average doctor and talk about this science, uh, they'll look at you very funny. <laughs> um, but that said, it, there is a movement going on and there are an increasing number of doctors. There's probably a few hundred in, in this country that are fully on board with this. Um, it's just, you have to find them. There's quite a few of them in, uh, in LA, as you might imagine. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'll leave you with a, a, last, a, with a last thought or um, a parting words, um, but I do want to thank you uh, for taking the time this morning to help us launch uh, our first book for the Harvard Chan Alumni Book Club. Um, as yours was the first book, uh, we're really happy to have you uh, next door at the medical school, uh, and also very uh, pleased and, and honored to have you here this morning to answer some of the questions that our book club participants asked. So uh, thank you very much for, um, for being with us here this morning. Oh, you're welcome, David, and thank you all for joining. Hopefully you're all well and safe and, uh, and staying young. Okay. Well, with that, thank you very much, everyone, for, for, uh, for calling in, and everyone have a great day. Bye-bye.